announcement that you've been you've been almost dying for. <laughs> this is the committee you long to serve on. Are we on? No. It's not showing a signal here. Okay. How's that? So, Patty Dove, you've been asked to serve the nominee committee. Appreciate your willingness to serve. Ricky, you thought you might get off? You've been asked to serve as well. Mary Jane, you've been asked to serve the nominee committee. Diana, you've been asked to serve the nominee committee. And Marty, you've been asked to serve. And Deborah, you've been asked to serve as an alternate. Alternate. And Nicolette, as an alternate. Not Nicolette. No, as an alternate. So we can meet right after church. So we can set a time we can meet. And then we'll have a great time. <laughs> so as a congregation, there's one word I need you to eradicate from your vocabulary. The word no. <laughs> now, Nelson. It's probably Nelson's first name. Dwight's Nelson's brother. You can't hear me? Well, that's, not, that's beyond my control. <laughs> well, you told the story of a nominating committee. And they needed a primary teacher. And so they, they asked, and several people said no. So finally they asked this last person, this person hated children. But they asked him to serve because they, they couldn't find anybody else who said yes. And he was determined not to say yes. But in a moment of weakness, he said yes. Now what, what inspired him to say yes was the pastor brought up one of the little primary girls and said, this is Susie. If we don't get a teacher for Susie's class, she might become a prostitute, run away and take drugs. He used all the guilt language he could possibly use. So the guy said yes. But after about two months, Susie said to the pastor, if you don't find a new teacher, I will become a prostitute. <laughs> it's important when the Nauta community meets and prays and searches that you also pray and ask God to lead you in the decisions you make so that you serve for the glory of God's kingdom. Not because you're afraid what might happen to a young girl. So anyways, I have a question for you. What brings you great joy? Think about it. And as you're thinking, in August, I think it was like 69, I was baptized into the Seventh-day Adventist Church. That brought me great joy, getting to know Jesus Christ. I grew up in a home where Jesus was never talked about. In fact, in our home, religion and, and, and politics were not discussed. My second greatest joy was August 18, 1975. Yeah, That's when Karen said yes <laughs> to me and my wife in front of the church crowd. And then June 12, 1978, our daughter was born. Those are all great moments of joy. <clears throat> what about you? What brings you great joy? Maybe a picnic with friends? Maybe a promotion at work? Maybe buying a new car or a new iPad? That was a subtle, <laughs> not so subtle yet. Helping somebody in need. Or maybe it went by the dolphins, which doesn't happen too often. What gives you great joy? Anybody want to share? What gives you great joy? Bible study on Friday nights. Bible study on Friday nights. Anybody else? Yes. Making others happy. Making others happy. Anybody else want to share? Yes. Singing with the praise team. Singing with the praise team, yeah. 
There's a second question. When someone becomes a Christian, how does he or she change? Now, the questions might seem different when they're actually interconnected. And so to understand joy, what makes someone really happy, and what makes someone really sad, we need to look at, this, at two stories in the Bible. The story of a happy man, and the story of a sorrowful man. And we're going to break this, these two stories up into two stories, two men, and two answers. The first one is found, if you have your Bibles, open to Matthew 13, the story that Diana read for us. Verse, Matthew 13, verse 44. This is a parable. That was very emphatic. Well done. Matthew 13, 44. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all he has and buys that field. Imagine yourself as a farmer and you're renting land. Uh, I lived in the Dakotas for several years, actually about 24 years. And many of those farmers, either if they're retired, will lease out their land. And many, because they need more acreage, will rent other land that they can't afford to buy. Imagine if you were a farmer and you were renting land. Although you'd love to buy it, you don't really have the resources to purchase it. And the price is really too high. And so, as I said, like a lot of farmers, you'll, you'll lease. But then as you're plowing, you discover, you, you discover something. And you, what you discover is worth millions of dollars. And now your attitude toward that land is totally changed. It's not that you don't want to buy it. Now you can't resist not buying it. And the only way you can buy it is to sell everything you own to generate enough funds to purchase at the purchase price. What kind of emotions do you think that farmer's feeling? He's just discovered millions of dollars. Joy, desire, desire, anxiety, somebody else will find Anxiety, <laughs> maybe a little anxiety when it gets to the bank, yes. <coughs> you know, he, he's got a Pontiac, in-home theater, condo, an iPad. And what does he think? A new iPad. A new iPad, yes. <coughs> 10 .4 inch iPad. These things, are, these things which were important to him, now they mean nothing. He is glad to sell them for whatever he can get out of them. All he is focused on right now is purchasing that property. Nothing compares in value to what's on that field. All this man once held dear, all he once thought important, all that he once valued, all that he once worked so hard to obtain now has no value at all. <coughs> and it's with great joy that he disposes of all his resources, his home, his car, his iPad, everything he owns, he sells. And his life is filled with joy. What gives you joy? things you own, the cars you drive. What gives you joy? And how is your life changed? Or how has your life changed since you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? So as we think about that, there's a second story we need to look at. It's a story about a man, and he's mentioned three times in the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Each author uses a different word to describe him. Matthew tells us that he's a young man. Luke tells us that he's a ruler. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all tell us that he's rich. 
So we, we call him the rich young ruler. And so if you turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 22. Mark 10, 17 through 22. Right. It's the story of the rich young ruler. So we've got the man who's, who, who was leasing the farmland, sold all his properties to buy the land. And then a man ran up to Jesus, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God. Now I hope the disciples heard that. Because Jesus was as clearly as he could say, He's God. He's divinity. Anyways, you know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking intently at him, loved him, said to him, You lack one thing. Go and sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. Shocked by the same, he went away, sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Now, do you get the background of the story of why this man came to Jesus? In the book of the Desire of Ages, on page 518, Desire of Ages 518, said that he saw the love that Christ manifested toward the children brought to him. He saw how tenderly he received them and took them up in his arms, and his heart was kindled with love for the Savior. He felt a desire to be his disciple. He was so deeply moved that Christ was going on his way. He ran after him, kneeling at his feet, asked with sincerity and earnest the question so important to his soul and to the soul of every human being. Good Master, what must I do to have eternal life? It's quite a scene. Mark tells us that Jesus is on his way. He's on his way to Jerusalem. He's on his way to the cross. And Jesus, as is, is his custom, oftentimes answers the question with another question. Why do you call me good? Because the young man didn't recognize to whom he was talking to. He saw Jesus as a, as a good teacher. He saw Jesus as his equal. Person of influence. Person of wisdom. A person who's good. Like the way ACS Lewis said, Jesus is either a liar, a lunatic, or he's the Lord. He cannot be only a good teacher. Amen. Now this man had a lot of good qualities. He was unlike many of the influential people that surrounded Jesus that were constantly attacking him. He knows that Jesus is good. He's confident that Jesus knows the way to eternal life. He is desperate to have the assurance of eternal life. So he kneels before Jesus. He runs and kneels before Jesus. In his culture, that's something that rulers don't do. But he did. Because he was so Sincere, so intent. And he is religious and he's sincere. So, what does Jesus say to him? You don't have to worry about me. You're good. You're good enough for eternal life. What did Jesus say to him? I am really impressed with you. I've been watching you. And you're the kind of person I want my kingdom. Is that what Jesus said? Is that what Jesus says to us? No. And yet many Christians worry, am I good enough for the kingdom of heaven? Jesus says to them, you lack something in your life. And so Jesus does two things. First, he looks the young man in his eyes. He wants the young man focusing on him, not on himself. This young man was very wrapped up in what he 
what he has, and what he's done, and what he could be. Because Jesus already said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God. So this young man needs to realize that Jesus is the key to eternal life. Because he is the Son of God. And secondly, Jesus loved this young man. He didn't reject him. He didn't ignore him. He didn't despise him. Mark says that he loved him. He saw great promise and potential in this young man. And that's what I love about our Lord. He looks past our faults. And he loves us anyways. He sees beyond our faults. He sees beyond our hangups. He sees beyond our flaws. He sees beyond our masks. He sees beyond our idiosyncrasies. He sees beyond our attitudes. So because he loves this young man, he tells him about an idol that's controlling his life. And he says, you need to give up all your possessions and give it to the poor. Not because money's bad, but for this young man, money was everything. What does he do? He becomes sorrowful. Jesus is trying to tell him how to find great joy. Go and sell everything you have and follow me. Jesus is appealing to his desires. He emphasizes the greatness of the reward of the kingdom of heaven is eternal life. No matter what you think about heaven, no matter what kind of picture you have, it will be even greater than to meet friends and loved ones. And, and I remember in the academy, someone said the great, the great joy of heaven will not only be there, but will be meeting people who are there. And then having someone said, I'm a little surprised you're here. And he said, well, you know, I'm a little surprised you're here too. <laughs> the rich young ruler wanted eternal life. And Jesus tells him that eternal life is, eternal life is not the result of some historic or heroic deed. Eternal life is not the result of living by certain laws and rules. But eternal life is based on a relationship with Jesus Christ. C.S. Lewis said, Our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. Find your greatest joy by following Jesus Christ. So we looked at two questions and two stories. Now we have two men. There are similarities and differences between these two men. The similarity is that they both have the opportunity of gaining a priceless, talk, priceless treasure. The man in the field discovered a treasure beyond, beyond description. He discovered the kingdom of heaven. Okay. Rich young ruler, he's looking for eternal life. But he doesn't want to sacrifice his idols. The man in the field, he treasures eternal life. Well, Chuck, you mentioned in Sabbath school that everybody knows John 3.16. And I thought that was true until I met, I played racquetball with a Jewish gentleman. And he said to me one day, why do people raise these signs up that say John 3.16. I, I couldn't imagine that, that someone in the United States wouldn't know what John 3.16 was. But apparently there are some people who are insulated against Christianity. And what does John 3.16 say? For God so loved the world, 
give up all I possess. The man in the field, he had no issue giving up everything he had because he knew something greater was coming. When I was a youth, not a youth pastor, when I was an associate pastor in Rapid City, South Dakota, I was young and green and needing a lot of mentoring. And there was a gentleman who was teaching Sabbath school class, and the Sabbath school class of that was the time of the end. And he said to me, I suppose you pastors expect us to keep returning tithe in the time of the end. I don't know what I said to him. I'm sure he wasn't too smart. When the time of the end, we won't have jobs while we're running, so we won't have any time to return. Besides, it's not pastors who expect it, it's what God expects of us. God expects us to let go of our idols and to let him be the king of our hearts. And that was the problem with the external ruler. Jesus was telling this man, you must let go of your idol if you want to follow me. What are the differences between them? We can summarize with one statement. One joyously gave up his possessions to get the treasure. One mournfully gave up the treasure to keep his possessions. Two questions, two stories, two men, and two answers. When someone becomes a Christian, how does their life change? Well, some might say, well, they quit smoking, they quit drinking, they quit playing cards. Some might say, they stop having fun. <laughs> Others might say, they spend lots of hours in church. I met a, a mother that was walking toward church who said, I need you to reach my children. They don't want to come to church, they don't want to be involved, they're unspiritual. And so we got involved in a program that, that involved them remodeling the youth chapel. Then that same mother came to me and said, my children spend way too much time in church. <laughs> How has a person's life changed? When someone becomes a Christian, he values Jesus Christ more than anything else. A true Christian has the greatest joy in the universe. True Christian finds his joy in Jesus Christ. Amen. John 17, 3, This is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Never does God ask us to deny ourselves something greater for something less. But he's asking us to let go of the lesser so that we can experience the greater. So in the end, I leave with that question. What brings you great joy? And how has your life been changed since Jesus Christ came into your life? Let's pray. Father heaven, two men, one whose life ends with great joy and one whose life ends with great sorrow. Lord, help us to choose joy for our idols. I pray in Jesus' name.
week of meeting and my lunch. Father in heaven, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for the lunch that's been prepared for us. Thank you for all those that are involved in this preparation. We ask, Lord, that as we leave this place, we leave as your missionaries, sharing the love of Jesus, encouraging others to let go of things that are holding them back, and letting Jesus have control of their life. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you.